Hello and welcome to the Learning Square. In this series of tutorials, I will be talking about TinyML. So TinyML is all about having tiny my machine learning applications which you are able to fit either on your phone or your microcontrollers. So the primarily whatever I will be talking about is from the uh, courses that I did from HarvardX available on edX. So this is a course called Fundamentals of TinyML. Then you have second course called Applications of TinyML. You have a third course called Deploying TinyML and then you have ML Ops of for Scaling TinyML. So apart from this, I would like to introduce you people to, the, to a website called edgeimpulse.com wherein uh, you are able to create these TinyML models to fit into your mobiles or your devices, microcontrollers which support machine learning algorithms to uh, be able to deploy them without having uh, much knowledge of either of the two fields, the embedded systems or the machine learning. Part. So after I log in, I get a, an option of creating a new project. So let's create a trial motion. So project. So now uh, the edge impulse project could, could capture data, which is from the accelerometer of either your mobile phone or your device that you connect with. You could capture audio files, you could capture images, or you could also capture Anything else like you have sensors on your board and you want to capture the data from those sensors, you could uh, capture those also. So let's start with the accelerometer. I'm not using a development mode right now. So I'll just cross this out. So I will first acquire the data. Now the idea is that I need to first acquire data that I want to train the model in. So primarily I'm trying to detect motions here. So maybe I will capture two, three motions and I will label them accordingly. I will acquire data. Then I will create a model to be able to train that data. Then I will be deploying that after testing. So let's go step by step. So I will use my mobile phone. So once I use my mobile phone, I'll get a QR code. So here you can see the way my mobile phone looks like. I can collect audio motion images. I will create, I will collect the motion here. So the label is left, right. I will set the label and I will start recording. You can see the length I can change. I've set it to seconds, 10 seconds. I could change that also. So here I have taken this as split automatically 80 by 20. So we will have 80% training data and 20% testing data. I could also put a label category into training and testing separately. Now then I'll just start recording. And you can see it's a window of 10 seconds. And for every one second, I'll try and emulate this motion here. Let me again capture this. To be able to make the robust model, a little bit of variation is okay because that's what humanly happens when we are uh, recording motions. Now I can change this to a label of up down. Again, a 10 second motion of up down. Similarly, I will record three instances of 10 seconds each here. To be able to get a more robust model, I need to have at least two minutes of data for each and every label that I have. So similarly, you could capture data here. Once your data is collected, I will go to the impulse design. If I go back to the data acquisition, you will be now able to see all the data that I have captured here. Now, uh, ideally, you should have a training and testing split of uh, 80 by 20 ratio. I could manually move this and send it to the test set. So I will collect more data and then I'll get back to you. 
So whatever I've collected right now is still a small data set where we have three kinds of labels. We have left, right motion. Then we have a wave motion wherein I was moving my phone like this in a waveform. Then a one is basically the up down motion that I have. So here you can see that I collected a data of maybe just a minute and I've split it into two parts. So here I have split it almost by 67 and 33 percent wherein I have taken three samples each and two I have retained in the training and one I have put in the testing part. So this is how I have split. It's still a small uh, data set but nevertheless uh, let's see how it works. So now we move on to the impulse design. Here it says uh, it asks us to create an input block. Since we are using a time series data we will use this. Now we have three input axes, the acceleration across the x axis, the y axis and the z axis. Our window sizes are suggested for a, a one second each and the window increases by this. So we can change it, we can play it around. So I'll generally put it to two seconds and maybe um, 80 millisecond change in this. The frequency is okay here. So then we add a processing block. We will go with the spectral analysis because that is what is recommended here. It automatically takes up three input axes, which are the acceleration across the X, the Y and the Z axis. Once this is done, we'll add a uh, learning block and we'll take in the classification one here. The neural network classifier, we will talk about this as we go on further and we have three output features because we had three labels so this is automatically giving us three output features. We will save this impulse. Now once we have created our impulse then we will move on to the spectral features. You can see here if you look at the one data you can see here that the green which is basically the acceleration across y is moving. So you can see the change here. Similarly in the other one Then we have a left to right motion. So across x axis, the acceleration is changing here. Similarly, in the other left and right, if you look at the wave motion, then you can see all the axes seem to be changing. The x, y and the z axis all have certain motion here. Now, these are the raw features that you extract. So uh, you can move this window and see the raw feature values here are changing and we can now start distinguish be uh, distinguishing between these values also. So if I have one here, this is primarily changing and the raw features are something like this. If I have a wave motion, then my raw features change. Now I could apply certain filters to smoothen this out because there's a lot of noise here. You can see this is kind of zigzag. So we do a filtering here and we apply a low pass filter here. Uh, in FFT and here you can see after the digital signal processing this is the kind of waves that we are getting which are smoothed out and in the frequency domain this is how it is looking like. So a wave is looking something like this. Let's look at a one here. So you can see in the green part is kind of substantially high than the other ones. Now the idea is to be able to uh, derive certain features which are kind of robust and which are able to distinguish between these motions. So once these features we are sure that we are okay with it, we could save the parameters. So we go by the default suggested by the model and you can see here the on device performance is like 5 milliseconds of processing time and only 5 KB of peak RAM usage is there. We could generate the features. Now a good idea to generate features is like suppose I want the model to be generated using one device and I want to deploy it on the other, then I generally go for feature generation so that the features stay with the model and once I deploy it on some other device, those kind of features are then mapped. So that's the idea of generating features. So here you can see the features are pretty well distinguished. Right? So the orange ones show me the one motion, the blue ones show me the left right motion 
and the green one is shown over here which is a different cluster altogether. So according to the accelerations I should be able to distinguish between these features very nicely. Apart from this a lot of features are up, uh, generated. So you have acceleration across the x the root mean square value then the height the frequency so spectral power a lot of features are there and you can just keep exploring so there are 586 samples and those many features are then generated here these many features for every axis so we have three classes here now we can just generate the features you can see the feature importance given here if I uh, try, want to see which feature is more important and this is actually helpful when it, which, when it comes to explainable AI. So when I'm designing models which I want to explain, so I am able to explain that my acceleration across the y root mean square value it has the highest feature importance because it is giving me, it helps me the most to distinguish between these three motions. Now moving on to the neural network classifier. I have the number of cy training cycles. So this is the number of epochs that I want to run my model for. Then the learning rate, I, I have kept it as 0 0.0005, which, and it could be 0 0.0001 also. We keep a generally small value. Anybody who studied neural networks would know that these are hyperparameters which you could do. A validation set size of 20% is kept. And then we have an input layer of 33 features. We keep a dense layer of 20 neurons, another dense layer of 10 neurons, and an output is going to be of three classes because I have left, right, one, and wave. Once this is done, we start training and we get this confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix is right now, it is giving me too much of accuracy. It's giving me 100% accuracy in terms of uh, the performance. Uh, so the model might be overfitting. We will see that further on. And you could see how this is actually working. So you can see left, right, it is able to correctly distinguish. This is one wave which is kind of uh, incorrectly classified. Apart from this, the performance is really nice. And how much time did it take? Because when we are talking about tiny ML models, we need to be very sure about the performance, the latency issues, the memory issues. So that is why we have to see the on-board, on-device performance as well. Now, uh, let's try and deploy this. So here what is happening is that we had 30 epochs. It trained for 30 epochs. It saves the best performing model, converts the TensorFlow Lite Float 32 model into an 8 int 8 quantized model because we want the space to be saved. Then it performs the, it calculates the performance matrix and it profiles these models and the model is complete. Now, once this is done, we have a neural network classifier in place. Let's go on to the live classification. So in the live classification, I will first try and connect my phone here. So you can see that my phone is now connected. Now here I can switch to classification mode. So it will retrieve the project here. And now it starts sampling. So let's look at the motions that I did here. So for the left and right, it is 100% sure that it was a left and right. Now hi, here I'm doing a circular motion. So it is confused between the left and right and the up and down motion. If I do an up and down, let's see whether it's able to. So you can see up and down, it is 100% confident that it's an up and right, up and down motion. So here if I do a motion which is kind of haphazard, what does it do? So if I do something like this, it is not sure, you know, it is, it is saying that it is like 21% confident that it's a left and right, it is uh, confused between these two. So any anomaly should be detected in the motion. So let's see how we can change that. So here when we go to the impulse design, here we can add another learning block. And here it is an anomaly detection, K means block. Once I add this, I can just save the impulse. The features remain the same. 
as soon as you kind of add this block there is an anomaly detection block which pops up and here I can choose my clusters to be dependent to be made on certain features. So there are certain features which is tell, it is suggesting me to take. So I have taken those features which it is suggesting me to take. Now these are the features according to which I will be able to kind of group all of these three motions into one category, probably one of these categories and make clusters out of this. So once I start training, you can see it has made these clusters. So these clusters are kind of dependent on these four features that we have selected. And according to these features, I am able to very well group these all the features together into clusters. Now, any data which is not in this cluster is not in one of these three motions will be an anomaly. So, let us see how it works out. So, again, we will retrain our model and once this is done, we will go to the live classification. So here we again retrain our models with the anomaly detection also taking into part. Once this is done, let's go on to the live classification part. I will again connect my phone. So now again I will go to the classification part. Now it will start. So let's sample. So here you can see for an anomalous motion it is the score is very high for an anomalous motion. So it is able to classify a motion which is coming in it is not discovering as an anomalous motion. So with this you will be able to make your model deploy your model. Uh, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.